Greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. Got a special show for you at this time. I'm interviewing two friends and colleagues, great guys in in our field of aviation, UFOs, and everything related to it. I've got filmmaker Darcy Weir here. And how do I describe this other, this other man, this aviation legend and perennial badass, Jim Goodall? <laughs> Uh, Jim and Darcy, welcome to the program. Great to have both of you here. I'm delighted to be here. I'm think, super yeah. excited. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. So I guess I'll just let people know we're, we're here because the three of us were involved in one particular project and this is, uh, Darcy's latest film. Um, I should say Darcy's a, a seasoned filmmaker in the field of UFOs and everything related to it. He's now done 10 documentary treatments. This is film number 10 for Darcy. It's called Secret Space UFOs, The Rise of the TR-3B. I'll have the links below. You can go, please check the links, um, everything relevant there. And uh, let me just introduce Jim a little bit more. J Jim, uh, I don't even know where to start with Jim Goodall. Like, <laughs> I've interviewed Jim before. He's he, he just told me before we started, he's written 29 books dealing with aviation, naval like I thought it was all on aircraft, but no, he's got a book now on the Nimitz class aircraft carriers and a book on submarines and like, good grief. Uh, military expert galore. He uh, was a master sergeant in the United States Air Force way back in the day. Worked on the A-12, which was the predecessor of the SR-71 Blackbird. First civilian photo photograph ever of the F-117 stealth fighter was taken by Jim Goodall. Uh, knew Bob Lazar before Bob was famous. Uh, had a famous quote. Uh, about Area 51, which uh, was the thing that got me to know about Jim Goodall, where he said, I talked to a guy that all these years at Groom Lake who said, I, I asked him if UFOs are real. He said, absolutely, positively, they exist. And in Darcy's new movie, Jim gives the name of that man. We can talk about all of that. So uh, I'm just thrilled to have both of you guys on here. And, and um, again, it's a pleasure. So I'm thrilled Darcy, to be we, back. Yeah, we, we did a good interview uh, as well a couple of years ago, Jim. That's right. Yeah. So, Darcy, can you talk about this new film? You had me in it. You had Jim in it. You'd had uh, Tyler Glockner of Secure Team in it. A few other folks. Uh, I've seen the screener. I thought it was very well done. Could you just tell folks about this film? Absolutely. Um, so I actually got you involved uh, in this film after I made sort of a precursor to this documentary called Secret Space UFOs Part 1. And uh, really, I was going back and looking at the history of NASA's involvement in space, you know, with the uh, X-15 and um, the early missions like Project Gemini and Mercury and then the Apollo missions and so on and so forth. And, you know, talking about the um, many different theories in terms of UFO cover up happening in space. And you liked the film. I said, hey, I'm going to be working on this next piece about, uh, you know, more secret space related stuff. Uh, I also sent that original film to uh, Jim. Jim really liked it. He sent me back some notes about the booster rockets being wrong and stuff like that, because he's just an encyclopedia of, um, you know, airspace, aerospace type of uh, stuff and equipment. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Yeah, we started working on this. It's about essentially the military's, you know, the Air Force and then third party contractors like Northrop Grumman or Lockheed Skunk Works um, involvement with building aircraft that, you know, are super top secret. And then we kind of go into the lore of a possible ARV, an anti-gravitic craft that many people even today are reporting of seeing, you know, flying over their neighborhoods silently. Mm -hmm. And, right. um, you know, uh, the, the remarkable story that first kind of got broken in the 19 early nineties by Edgar Fouché. And, um, I know, I do know that you kind of take a little bit of issue with Edgar Fouché. But I wanted to include him in the documentary because I, th I thought it was interesting. You know, whenever we talk about Bob Lazar, we always equate him to being 
predominantly legit, you know, some things he talked about eventually manifested in mainstream science, science, right? So if you look at uh, the claim of element 115 that has manifested at this point um, and all kinds of other stuff with Edgar Fouché, he was talking about uh, metamaterials, which weren't very public at the time. Uh, he was talking about quasi crystals again, not really <clears throat> out there in the public, and they're a very real thing now. That's right. Um, and he was talking about a rotating superconductor engine that was uh, operating in this anti gravitic craft, which was a crude um, reproduction of maybe something like Bob Lazar's sports model. And um, yeah. I am curious as to what you think about. Fouché now that like, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, when you mentioned, I, I'm not, I'm not here to dunk on Edgar Fouché. I've spoken with him in the past and uh, I'm not, I'm not a debunker. I'm not out to uh, try to, you know, just dis discredit him at all. In fact, there's a lot, I followed his work for a long time. And I, I suppose for me, I just was sitting on the fence about him for a while. I didn't really, I didn't have confidence in my own scientific uh, engineering abilities to decide what I thought of it. I asked around about Edgar Fouché and I got different opinions, but uh, I wouldn't say that I'm a, a doubter or a hardcore believer. Um, if anything, I probably lean more toward the belief that he was, that he was truthful in the things that he said about the TR three B. And he is the guy who really brought this out for the first time. I, I would say before we go further, can I show the trailer of this? Film? absolutely yeah Let, let's do that it. it's a two minute piece and let's see if i can do this the right way so here we go while it's been widely discussed that ufos are of an alien nature uh, we are starting to realize that many of these may also be man-made the stuff i was working on wasn't classified the programs that were monitoring were unconventional and unacknowledged activities and science that are not supposed to exist. It accelerated at about a 30 degree angle of attack and left him in the dust. I mean, boom, eight to 10,000 miles an hour. They looked like butterflies that were on fire. Well, when I played the footage back, there was a TR-3B sitting there cloaked above that ship the entire time. Why is it that if these are solid triangular craft, are we able to sometimes see stars through them? You're going to have a militarization of space, like an arms race in space, and that's going to require a significant classified component. That is a secret space program. We're dealing with something very close to alien technology, engineered down to the atomic level. Something really odd is going on out there. Oops. Wow. Okay. There we go. I'm glad that went off without a hitch. I didn't know if I'd be able to do that. Um, great trailer. Yeah, one thing great, that, great trailer. Yeah. Um, one thing that just blew my mind when I was watching it was how much excellent video of these triangular craft you were able to get access to and to display. Some of that was apparent in the trailer. Uh, and there was just much, much more that, you were able to present that I thought was really quite, quite extraordinary. I want to ask Jim a question if, sure. if I may. I'll just pipe in real quick though. Oh yeah, go. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> in terms of those videos, the thanks really goes out to Tyler Glockner because he has amassed such a vast fan base of, of followers online. And he did a shout out, uh, you know, earlier last year and said, Hey, I'm looking for TR three B videos, possibly stuff shot this year. And all these people started emailing me and said, you know, this is what I recorded. And I went through the best of the best and I included that stuff in the documentary. So really kudos to him. And then mm -hmm. Alara, who's the lady that's in the trailer there that has an incredible video that she yes. filmed at contact in the desert, you know, just before uh, the virus took over the planet and shut down all conferences. 
in 2019, she recorded that. And it's like everything that we talk about in terms of a TR3B's capability and and her testimony is exhibited in that and video. Honestly, since we're just talking about that, I, I was at that conference with uh, my wife, Tracy. We were there in 2019 and I didn't see that. Her video of that triangle was superb. Absolutely superb. Just incredible. Much. Yeah. yeah and, and just like being invisible to the human eye, uh, possible putting on a, a fake sort of light show, you know, these fake UFOs being projected. This is the, the technology that we talk about, like metamaterials would allow you to do that. Right. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Quasi crystals would be able right. to refract light and change the image of what the craft is actually looking like. And then she was able to record it and then see it when she looked at the video, but she couldn't see it with her own naked eye, which is crazy. Yeah, that's extraordinary. So Jim, yep. you've, you've got such a long history with, uh, secret aircraft. Uh, as I was mentioning in the intro, you worked on the A-12. People don't know what that is. They should. That's the predecessor of the SR-71 Blackbird, an amazing aircraft. Uh, I know you're an expert in telemetry. You took the first civilian photograph of the F-117 stealth fighter. You knew Bob Lazar before anyone else really knew much about him. What do you, what do you think about the development of a secret space program? I remember chatting with you about this a few years ago, but like uh, objects that are shaped like boomerangs or wedge shaped or triangles. I mean, they're not supposed to exist officially, but people have been seeing them and recording them seemingly reliably for many years. Do you, what do you have, do you have thoughts about how this craft has, was developed and what it, what principles it operates on? Well, first of all, any, any aircraft that the government decides to declassify and show you, you know, they're now retired, but we're going to show you Good example is the A-12. That thing was retired 20 years before they ever admitted its existence. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, and we've been, we've had an active uh, military space operation since the manned orbiting laboratory. They, they call it the mole. It, it was supposed to be you know, the first phase of a potential uh, uh, space station but it was really a, it was it was a spy location manned with military officers. What what year was did that start operation? Early seventies. Okay. Yeah, if you if you type in manned orbital laboratory, mm -hmm. uh, it'll give uh, not the full yeah. history because a lot of it's still classified. And that was done, yeah, you know, almost fifty years ago. Yeah, early early seventies. And we know and, next to nothing about it today. Really. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, it's, and the, uh, you know, and as far as not being, having a TR-3B sort of disappear or, or blend in with the sky, they've been, the military has been working on active camouflage since the, since the 60s. I mean, as far as electronically, mm -hmm. and they have, and they've gotten to where thin film technology is so good today that, you know, that it, it would not be a weight penalty or even an operational penal, penalty on a, uh, low observable aircraft to be covered with this type of, it's like a big video screen that wraps around the whole airplane. They yeah. I was just going to ask if you, could over. if you could describe active camouflage. So it's, it's, it's optical camouflage is what you're correct. Kind of correct. Saying. And what yeah. it, there are cameras top bottom on the side. So if you're looking, if you're on the ground, you're looking up, it has cameras looking straight up and you're going to see what's above the airplane. If you're an air, if you were to, and an aircraft above one of these craft and looking down, you would see the ground. Now there will probably be some distortion as it's moving through, if it, yes. as it's moving through the area, but it's still invisible to, to the naked eye. Uh, and the uh, thing about the, uh, the video that X showed it when, you know, when she uh, looked at it, you know, afterwards, after she you know, uh, videotaped it and now it's, you know, it's just showing up. The, the the eyeball has has a, a limited range as far as colors and changes in tech you know in texture of a, of an image, as we're mm -hmm. electronically, uh, that's not the case, and that's what that's what allowed the image to show through even though it was it was only maybe a, a tenth of a percent darker or lighter than the background, but it was yes. enough it was enough so we could see it. So now the military has been up there forever and whoever, whoever gains the high ground in space controls the world. 
Yeah. It makes me wonder when people see UFOs or other like exotic craft that we're normally not supposed to see. Like I think, all right, so if there's aliens doing this, they, they've got to be able to have the same kind of invisibility technology, but yet we see these objects. They're recorded every single day. And, um, although I will point out there, there's so many, some of my favorite sightings to, um, track are these like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. sightings where someone will be outside and they'll just make out a craft that is ultra stealthy, ultra camouflage, but they they see it. Um, often it's, they can just barely make it out, but they do see it. Uh, but other times it's, these objects are a bit more obvious to see. And when that's the case, I just wonder, I mean, I don't know if we can answer this, but do they just not care? Are they just saying, oh, we're going to switch off the cloaking device now? I think there's, I think they're trying to desensitize us. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and I, Darcy, and most everybody I hang around with, if all of a sudden a UFO would land uh, in the middle of the Super Bowl, we would go, oh, that's cool. <laughs> but there's a lot of people out there where they would go absolutely bananas. Mm -hmm. The glue that holds the majority of the world together is a, is, a, is a strong belief in a supreme being, be it God, Jesus, Muhammad, Adam Smith, Buddha, you know, the, uh, the 7-Eleven down the street, whatever. Mm -hmm. And if all of a sudden everything that you believed from a religious point of view turns out to be they were little green men from Mars, that's going to have a pro profound effect on, on, on who, who these people are. I mean, they, that's the glue that keeps us all together. That's the glue that keeps you from com committing mass murder, even though there's some people are really good at it. Well, uh, I mean, like, I'll just kind of add to that. Um, you know, I, I feel I've spoken to you, Richard, about this in the past, that the secret space theory um, or the research field of uf ufology, right, uh, Secret space is a very like buzzword in, in that study area, right? And I felt like before making these documentaries, the major representation of, of secret space was this sort of like pseudo spirituality or this like schizophrenic story of people being age regressed and put in back into their younger self body and doing missions on Mars and, you know, uh, bird people and all, all, you know what I'm referencing. Yes, and, and yes. That really stole the show for a long time. And I think it takes away from the very credible, just base um, theory of secrecy missions that are being conducted in space that are being hidden from the general public. Yes, and yes, absolutely. I think that's the most important thing that grounds us in reality. It, it takes us, you know, and, you know, people could watch the film Don't Look Up. And that is just okay. just the title of, of the film is enough uh, of a comment on society these days. We don't look up enough. We don't care about what's up there. We care more about what's down on our phone screen or, mm -hmm. you know, what's happening on Instagram or what some celebrity said or, and space is the final frontier, right? And yep. if there is a UFO cover up habit happening, it has to be happening in space as well. And yes, absolutely. The, instruments that our scientific institutions have up there are just completely covered in cameras. I mean, I was at the Kennedy Space Center. I was at the Houston uh, Space Center both like last year recording for these documentaries that I'm making. And you walk around the shuttle Atlantis and you can't even count on one hand, the amount of cameras that are all around just every single surface of that shuttle has a different sort of camera set up. Um, the uh, mm. Canadian arm, the Canadian arm, the robotic arm that was so famous has like three cameras on it. Every you Canadian know, so I talk to 
talks about the Canadian arm on that space shuttle. Yeah. And it's for good reason. It's that's Canadians in space, that one famous arm, but well, it's, it is very impressive. Yeah. But you know, it's like if they have all those cameras and they're recording all this data and then you've got guys like Martin Stubbs um, and the other guy who's escaping me, you told me about him and I, I looked into him too, the, the uh, wheelchair bound guy. That oh, was Jeff, Jeffrey Challenger. Jeffrey Challenger. Out of they Sacramento. Were, yes. They were brilliant. They went, they just, they went through all of the videos that were out there and, you know, from NASA's downlink that, that you could get and they scrubbed through and they found UFOs. They yeah. found stuff that couldn't be explained. And that is enough to comment on and talk about. And then, you know, you have the STS 48 mission, Dr. Jack Kasher wrote a really cool physics paper on that. I included you had that him on at the end. Documentary. You had him yeah. on at the end of the of the film, which I thought was great. He did a fantastic job. You did a nice interview with him. I get. And he talked. To, he talked very. Come here. Oh, okay, Jim's got something to do there. He's got uh, his girl, his baby girl, coming to say hi. But um, yeah, like. <laughs> Jack Kasher is just such a fascinating guy and he worked for NASA and he was curious about these videos that were coming out and, you know, uh, many different researchers, Don Ratch back in the day, mm -hmm. investigating them. And they just, NASA always has a de facto answer. And it's usually from the folks like Jim Oberg that just say, it's just sp space ice. You know, it's space junk and our cameras are picking it up, but that just can't be the de facto answer for all of it, you know? And, um, what I, I like about your films, Darcy is you, you have a very technological, uh, like a military technology angle. When you approach this subject of secret space, you've done this a few times now. And as you were saying, you, you don't go into, uh, you don't really go into fantasy. You don't go into anything that's not, uh, even documentable. Uh, you, you're very, very careful with how you present this. And, but even, even while you do that, you, you're not afraid to get into some of the really strange, uh, extreme things that we, we think are going on out in earth orbit and beyond. So it is why I like your films. I think you've, you've really, uh, taken a nice, a good niche and, and being able to take this space of, really discussing extreme black world technology. Yeah, I really appreciate going. that. I mean, mm -hmm. like I started my whole journey in documentary making with the Phil Schneider story, which I know is infamous and not everything he said is true. And you and I have, that's how um, we met. That's how we met. That's how mm -hmm. we, you know, started our relationship. And I agree with you. Like many of the things that he did were kind of, um, they were highlighting, already well investigated or starting to become uh, popular in the ufology field theories like underground bases yeah. and a secret space program and, um, you know, UFO cover up and ancient aliens and all that type of thing. Uh, but he did it with such charisma and his fantastical story of being shot by an alien, you know, in an underground base construction battle it was like straight out of the, the late eighties and he was lecturing in, in the early nineties. It was like mm -hmm. a combination of rainbow and Rambo and uh 007. You know, he even says I had a Walter PPK with a modified nine shot clip or something like that. And it's like, uh, okay. But yeah, it was interesting. And no, absolutely. I, I had to follow it. But I like to trade. I try to stay grounded in fact these days. You know, um, I mean, I'm a young guy, but I was even younger then. This is like 10 years ago. I started making that doc, and um, I really, you know, I'm trying to evolve as a filmmaker and tell stories in a very grounded way, if possible. I've worked with guys like Jaime Mausan, and he's extremely ungrounded. And it was interesting to interact with an individual like that that's been doing uh, UFO re research and journalism, mainstream journal journalism in Mexico for over 40 years. 
Like, Mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's, he's not, the thing is people in this community tend to be very polarizing, right? I don't believe Bob Lazar. I believe Bob Lazar. I don't believe anything uh, Jaime Malson says now because something he did was totally, you know, a hoax. Yeah, but he had a 40-year career uh, doing some other stories that definitely weren't a hoax, you know, and were like big UFO mass witness sightings in Mexico, that type of thing, right? So That's right. Um, I... I I think this subject is full of all kinds of narratives and some are completely ungrounded and some are, are grounded. And I think the secret space um, sort of arena or uh, slice of ufology is a really interesting one. And, you know, TR three B's, if you watch this doc, you know, you look at a B two bomber F one seventeen flying in the air and you hear it. You know, I, I was, given the rights to use that footage from a guy that goes out and records these while they're test flying or, or doing a a practice mission or something. And those like, literally you, when you're watching on the TV, it's almost like it's, it could vibrate your body. If you were standing underneath them, a TR three B no, no sound whatsoever hovering silently. So So what is that working on? I want to talk about you had you interviewed Jeremy Rees, the AKA alien scientist for this. And I have to say he was really on point for uh, the things that he had to say about that. And, and I want to get into that in a minute. He's talking about uh, rotating mercury plasma, uh, talking a lot about Ed, Edgar Fouché's work as well. Before we do that, I would like to ask Jim, uh, there was one thing in, in your film, Darcy, that Jim had to say that I just thought was actually historically important I don't know if it was said before, but again, we're talking about, uh, well, Dave Fruhoff. And Jim, I just wonder if you could tell that story, because you tell it very nicely in the documentary, uh, The Rise of the TR-3B, and you mentioned Dave Fruhoff by name because he's he's now deceased. Could you just tell listeners what what that's about? Sure, and I've known uh, Dave since the mid-70s. Met him, you know, I met him through the Blackbird Association, uh, and I was was in... Tullahoma, Tennessee, my dad uh, was a senior engineer over at the uh, wind tunnel complex there in Tullahoma. And Dave lived in Lynchburg, 11 miles away. It's also the home of Jack Daniels. And I was, I, I called him up and said, hey, I'm in, I'm in the area. Can I come out and give you a visit? Uh, let's talk about your crash. He crashed in, he was a student pilot in SR-71 that he had a bail out of. So I said, "Oh yeah, come on down." So we went through the we went through his whole scenario of uh, you know the crash. Can, can people just happened. realize what that means? Like, not <laughs> everyone's an SR seventy one pilot. First of all, all right, yeah. we're talking the fastest aircraft in the world, totally secret, flying out of Area fifty one at like ridiculous altitudes, ridiculous speeds, like almost Mach three. I'm thinking, I don't know, like super fast, right? So right. that's right. that's what he did. He had a bail out of that. So right. Just, well, he was, just so people was, appreciate this. <laughs> and and we're talking, I mean, the speed of a Blackbird is, you know, when you fire a 30-odd six, I think the, the round comes out of the barrel at maybe 1,700 feet per second. Per second. This is a 70-ton air, manned air-breathing airplane that goes through the air at 3,400 feet per second, or two miles every three seconds, or 43 oh miles a minute. And uh, Dave, they had a total electrical failure. They were trying to, you know, he was trying to bring the airplane back. He, he was a student pilot. He's in the SR-71 trainer, the B model, 957. The instructor pilot is, is in an elevated cockpit behind him. And when they had a total electrical failure, of course, both of them are going through the TO. So what happens when you lose both electrical systems on the airplane? And they were just talking back and forth on intercom. They d- had no radios. They had no nav aids other than a, a standby compass. Uh, they were five miles from the end of the runway as we're coming in. They dropped the gear. The angle of attack went up. The, uh, f- the fuel sump emptied out. The airplane had a, a flame out. It went upside down, and both guys jumped out. They got Both guy, guys got out okay. But when I was there, I said, okay, yeah, Dave, he said, 
do you believe in UFOs? And he said, they absolutely positively do exist. And of course, that sort of said, you want to expand upon that? Unfortunately, a couple of people who have said that, you want to expand upon that? And they said, well, no. But Dave said, yeah. I said, well, why, why, are you, why do you believe in U, UFOs were real? He said, because I chased one. I said, what do you mean? So he said, go back uh, late 72, early 73. He said, I'm flying an SR-71 Blackbird out of Kadena, Okinawa. It's detachment one of the 9th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing. He was in a night training mission, and they didn't fly a lot of night missions, but uh, starting early, you know, early 70s, they, they figured they may have to do some training on it. Mm -hmm. So they're out in the far western Pacific uh, near the Philippines. He's at 78,000 feet, cruising at Mach 2.7, which is about 1,700 miles an hour. And three-quarter moon off to the left side of the airplane, and he gets a glint off of something metallic five or six miles off to the right side of the airplane and five or 6,000 feet above him. So he gets on secure voice and he calls Kadena and he said, he calls the command post. Hey, we have another bird up. He said, you're at briefing. You're the only one up there. He said, no, I have company. I'm going to go take a look. Mm -hmm. About that time, his backseater said, hey, Dave, we have company. He said, yeah, I know. So at Mach 2.7, at uh, 78,000 feet, the SR-71 is pretty much in idle mode. I mean, it's, it's cruising along using almost no fuel. Wow. And, and you stay there until you're ready to go over target. And that's when, that's when you accelerate up to Mach 3 minimum, uh, preferably Mach 3.2, and try to go over target above 80,000 feet. So Dave advanced the throttles, never taking his eye off the uh, object, and he's about a 10 degree bank and he's climbing, heading towards it. And he didn't, he didn't want to make any fast moves. He's going pretty fast because you, you, know, you don't pour more than one and a half G's on that airplane. Also, it may decide to come apart on you. And uh, he was trying to see a shape of the object. He said it was reflective. He doesn't know if it's metallic or just a, you know, a shiny plastic surface, you know, surface or highly polished metal or whatever. But he was trying to see if he could see the shape because it was blocking out all the stars. You know, at 78, 80,000 feet, you have starlight. I mean, the stars are there and there's a lot of them. Yeah, you're super and, high up there. Yeah. And uh, it, it, he, couldn't, he couldn't make out a shape. So when he was still a couple, a thousand or so feet below the object and still a mile or so away, this thing took off at about a 30 degree angle of attack and left him in the dust like he was heading the other direction. He estimated the speed to be somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 10,000 miles an hour. And he lost track of it, he lost sight of it, going between 180 and 200,000 feet. So back in the day, there was no way uh, you could report UFOs. I asked my boss once, he was a two-star, I said, General Gatlin, if I was a pilot and I saw a UFO, what should I do? And this is in the 80s. Uh, mind you, in the 70s. He said, you land, do your debrief, go to the O Club, have a couple stiff drinks, go home and forget about it. <laughs> I said, why is that? He said, he said if God. you want a sure way to destroy your, your career, especially mm -hmm. flying something like a Blackbird, you would go and say, hey, I was chasing UFOs in an SR-71. That's not going to get you a, a good conduct medal or even a promotion. Man, thank yeah, you for, I, for telling that story because... Uh, we never had a name to go with that. It's something that you told uh, a number of times. I know that quote. Well, the, the other the other thing, he in 1980 he retired from the Air Force, and he had a real high security clearance, and he got a job of all places a facility manager at Area 51. Mm -hmm. And and I I said, uh, well, what about the underground facilities? He said, I was responsible for every single structure within the Area 51 confines. And there are no, as far as he knew, there are no underground facilities at Area 51. But he said, just on the other side of the Papoose Range, we have equipment out there that the Nevada test site's been using for drilling 36-foot diameter holes through solid granite at about a foot an hour. So the technology, that technology exists in the Nevada desert. But to it's go not deep a, underground, to go yeah. deep underground, yeah. But it's but it's not at Area 51. 
He didn't, you know, he didn't say it, it wouldn't mm-hmm. be at S4 or somewhere else within, you know, with maybe the backside of the Papoose range. But he said, if it, if there had been, been a facility, he was going to be, he had to be responsible for its uh, maintenance and well being. So, and he looked, he looked and he asked around after he was here about a year, do we have, did we ever flight test anything that could outrun an SR 71? And everybody there said, no. I yeah. Mean, and I mean, people, people would question, you know, what was that, that Fruhoff chased? And if people are thinking it's a TR three B or something that is super black that we were working on back then, I mean, the rumor is that we test flew something like this in the late 1979. And if you look at, um, you know, Ronald Reagan's diary entry on uh, June 11th, 1985, he says, our shuttle capacity is such that we could have 300 people orbit. And I think he was kind of read into some of the secret space stuff that was going on. You know, he was at the the helm of uh, Star Wars project and so mm-hmm. on and so forth. Uh, I think the TR-3B was, was well, look, the TR-3B is a name for something that we can't put our finger on, but people describe as being one of these black triangles. And if you listen to Edgar Fouché's descriptions of the TR-3B, it was massive. It could carry huge amounts of personnel and equipment, like a tank, into space. So... Um, you know, if, if any sighting that could maybe equate to something like this fabled craft could do, it would be something like what we saw at, uh, you know, the Phoenix lights, but I don't even know if that was a T or three B that was a massive triangle. And what was seen there was, was immense. I mean, you had the visual sightings that were, uh, during the day and then you had the, the video of, uh, seemingly a large structure at night. And I think that was something different. Uh, people were obviously seeing some kind of wedge shaped or maybe even triangular shaped craft, maybe even boomerang shaped Phoenix. Can I ask you, I'm glad you made a, this transition to the TR three B Darcy, because we've got about 20 minutes to go. And I, I'd really like to get into uh, both Edgar Fouché and what Jeremy Rees was saying about this craft, because um, one of the really nice things about this film, frankly, is that you had, those two individuals brought out some very good technical engineering scientific points about the TR-3B. And maybe you can explain this. Uh, you, you know, I mean, I, I know that the, the concept was that this craft is a triangular craft. Uh, Fouché talked about a, a gravity disruption device or a mag- magnetic field disruptor. I think that was part of this. Um, that was the that was the circular uh, the accelerator part of the craft I think as he described it, and then there was talk about this rotating mercury plasma, um, or a, and some of this I'm I'm not really good at like a superfluid yeah, anti gravity okay. centrifuge so, engine and that eliminates most but not all of the mass requiring different thrusters and for direction and, and lift and so forth. Can you describe right. some how this thing op- operates? So it was a super cooled mercury uh super superconductor so rotating and this combined with uh you know something else that we don't know the secret sauce of just yet was able to create an anti-gravitic propulsion upwards right Mm -hmm. and we have many different scientists that have come forward uh throughout the world really that have talked about rotating superconductors nasa in the 19 late 1950s published a paper on how a rotating superconductor could work to possibly produce this anti-gravitic effect you have ning li who uh, is a famous chinese physicist that um you know basically is she's no longer with us now but she lectured on anti-gravity working. And the center of that theory was a rotating superconductor. Um, 
you also have Potklinov out of Russia and his paper on a rotating superconductor and showing how it would work. So, you know, if American scientists are not trying to reproduce the effects of a rotating superconductor in some kind of clandestine uh, aerospace project, it's impossible because the American Air Force and the best and brightest that are uh, at the helm of protecting the nation have in their best interest to know uh, this type of technology if it's workable. And, you know, you talk about Putin. Um, he threatens that even if we launched our nuclear missiles over at Russia, they have technology that could take them out of the sky and space in seconds. What is he talking about there? Is he talking about their own black budget aircraft that are possibly built off the same designs as we have? It's possible because a lot mm -hmm. of the stuff we make gets copied by the Chinese, get co gets copied by the Russians. That's why there's so much secrecy and protection of this type of technology. We don't want it to fall into enemy hands. And if you talk to Michael Schratt, who is uh, almost like Jim Goodall's son, uh, yeah. <laughs> he will quite honestly mention the burn trenches. And that is a very famous thing that uh, apparently at places like Area 51, if they finished a project on something they don't want to get out there, they destroy everything about it, even the materials. They burn it. Even the tools. The tools. So it can't be, you know, reverse engineered by an enemy nation if, if a spy even gets their hands on it, right? So I just went on a rant about that, and I haven't talked about the TR3B enough. What Jeremy Reese talks about uh, is that, you know, he did a very thorough investigation of the TR-3B. He has a degree in physics and he's an interesting, intelligent guy. Um, yes. I really wanted to include his testimony because he got really close to Edgar Fouché before he died. Edgar Fouché was dying from cancer from some kind of materials that were being used out at Area 51. He, there's a photo in the documentary of him under an F-117 being built. And that's in a hangar, apparently, at Area 51. Um, he wasn't, he was a, you know, a security officer over there. He wasn't a uh, physicist or, you know, an engineer, so to speak, building that. But he was present. And there's other people, his name is escaping me, but there's a, uh, a guy that was suing the government recently because he got cancer and really sick from some tests at Area 51. I'll look it up in a second and let you know his, his name. But that's an incredible case. It, it all points back to stuff that's being tested at Area 51. And if you look at Edgar Fouché's description of the TR-3B, he says it used metamaterials. That is materials that um, are not – they operate – on sort of a physics level. He didn't they, call the metamaterials though in 1998. Did, did he, did he use that phrase? He did. I think he was described. He actually said metamaterials. Yeah. And quasi crystals. Okay. And, and uh, you know, uh, a rotating superconductor. I thought he was simply describing materials that, I mean, metamaterials, uh, I think a lot of people listening probably are familiar, but they're highly, uh, in, intricately engineered materials that is the very shape of, and we're talking at the, at the nano and even angstrom level, perhaps uh, where the, the manner in which they're engineered has uh, a great effect on the properties of the material itself. So they can be used for either super strength or super conductivity and things like this. Yeah. And, and or electrogravitic it, effects and, and, and the like. It, it comes back to, you know, stories like Bob Lazar's, a, uh, sports model, right? Mm -hmm. This is supposedly a craft that had a anti-gravitic engine in the middle. And he did a illustration of it. And, you know, you can even uh, look it up on Google. And then around the middle of this anti-gravitic center of the craft are three pylons shaped in a triangle. Mm -hmm. So if you look at what's told of a TR-3B, it literally looks like a crude macro scale version of what these scientists might have been trying to 
duplicate. Well, that's very um, interesting. Yeah, I mean, you've got. I think this talk about the meta material too. I mean, that Fouché was talking about this so early. That, that's really far ahead of everybody else because when you're thinking about, like, what is it that makes these objects go the way they do? In in the '90s, I mean, I was just starting out, really researching UFOs, and uh, I certainly was a total novice, but. I didn't hear anyone talking about the quality of the materials. It was all about the engine and propulsion and all of this. But when you really think about material science, how critical it would be, and when you think about what metamaterials are, when you understand it, it's a no-brainer that they would be incredibly important in the construction of any kind of craft like this. And here's, here's Fouché talking about it, as far as I can tell, before anybody else. So I think that's quite significant. And, uh, and I, I really want to credit Jeremy for his discussion about this because and then he brings up quasi-crystals. Can you, he's not here, but can you so, describe the, the phenomenon of quasi-crystals and how that fits into this? Sure. So quasi-crystals are not, are like there's crystals that appear in nature, right? Like quartz or uh, silicon, diamonds. that type of thing. Diamonds, right? Whatever. But Quasi-crystals are something that is an artificial crystal that's been manufactured for a purpose. And, um, you know, going back to metamaterials, relating to that, this is down to the atomic level. And when you talk about people that have possibly been present to alien technology, stuff that is in terms of uh, science is so far ahead of our current um, investigations into science. It's basically the future. We're looking at the future when we look at an alien craft. Mm -hmm. And you talk about uh, Colonel uh, Philip J. Corso, the day after Roswell, he describes all this technology coming out of possibly, uh, you know, a, a catch, a, a, a caught downed craft, right? the Roswell, New Mexico crash. And whenever scientists are looking at this, they're describing something that is manufactured down to the atomic level. We Which don't, I don't think we, we are able to do that yet, not in this manner. I know with no. metamaterials, they're getting down close to the angstrom level, I think. I think we're basically at the nano level, which is very tiny, but we're not at the atomic level. I, yes. I don't think. And so... You know, looking at this atomic level technology, you're able to do things like uh, make light spectrum cameras that probably are m like thousands of years ahead of what we have now. And we're we've got amazing camera technology. Um, you've got <clears throat> the ability to cloak, right? The ability to do what Jim was talking about at the starting of this uh, conversation. You know, you could coat your whole bottom of your space plane with some kind of material like a television screen, but even more advanced than that. And it can refract the light from above and just mirror it to the ground. So anybody that looks up is just seeing the sky. Um, and so let me ask, can I ask you both? Uh, I'd like to, I want to just jump in and ask Jim, if you don't mind, sure. but I want to ask you both. Um, we're actually getting toward the end here. And, so I assume you you believe we're, we've been building the TR-3B. And do you, do you think that we've got a TR-3B out there, Jim, or that? Oh, I mean, better? absolutely. Yeah. I mean. So when, I do you mean think, when do you think we did it? And what do you think it's being used for? It's probably been flying since the 70s. I don't, it probably isn't, wasn't operational until the 80s. And it's utilizing some it, something like what we've been describing in terms of technology and very, some very possibly anti gravitic type of uh, right. It may be it's possibly using the same type of propulsion system that Darcy's been talking about, or what Bob Lazar was talking about. And and I go every, you know, when we talk about stuff like this, I go back to my conversations with Ben Rich. Mm -hmm. Ben Rich, for those who don't know, replaced Kelly Johnson as the president and general manager of the Lockheed Skunk Works. And as early as 1986, uh, my dear friend John Andrews wrote him a letter. They were pen pals and said, uh, Ben, he said, I have a question for you and Kelly Johnson. Do you believe in UFOs? Now, there's two categories, both man-made and extraterrestrial. And 
Um, Michael Schwad has the original letter that Ben wrote back on his corporate letterhead as president of the Skunk Works. And he said, both Kelly and I are, are firm believers in both categories. We refer to ours as unfunded opportunities. He underlines the U, the F, and the O. Mm -hmm. If you didn't fund something, it was given to you or you recovered it. One of the I two. always figured it meant, he meant crash retrievals. That was my, my assumption when I first read that. Not necessarily opportunities. because or shortly, gift, after, gift. <laughs> shortly after he retired from the skunk works, he gave a talk uh, at a graduate aeronautical graduate students function at UCLA. And one of the comments he made, and I'm sure it, it shocked a lot of people. He said, we have the ability to take ET home. Now think about that statement. We have the ability to travel across the universe. It's like 19, 1994, I think it was when he gave uh, it. I think 93. I think he 93. said that. Because yeah. Yeah. he retired right at the end of uh, the beginning of Desert Storm. He mm -hmm. wanted to make sure his F-117 did the job. And then in my conversation with him, and like we talked earlier, that everybody associated with or in close contact with the F-117 during its production are all su suffering from cancer. Every maintenance guy that worked on that airplane at Area 51 has uh, polyps in his, in his colon. They have mm. uh, all sorts of rashes and stuff. But um, I talked, I spoke with Ben the last time about 10 days before he passed away. And we were talking about a little bit of everything, but we got into talking about John Andrews and stuff. And then he said, Jim, we have things out in the desert. And I don't think he was referring to Area 51. We have things out in the desert that's 50 years beyond what you can comprehend. I can comprehend a heck of a lot. And he said, if you, and if you see move, seen movies like Star Trek or Star Wars, we've been there, done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. I said, Ben, you want to expand upon that? And he said, no, which was very typical of Ben. And he had the nerve to die on me about 10 days later. Oh, so man. I never had a chance to sit down with him. Yeah. So every, I mean, when, when someone like him says, makes a statement like that, and then I have my incident uh, in the Pentagon uh, when I was, I had some, I had some uh, extra time on my hands and I had Bob Lazar's W-2. So I'm trying to find the, the United States Navy organization that paid him. And it wasn't, that name wasn't anywhere in the Pentagon directory. So I found something that was close, the Department of the Navy. And I went into that office and I'm in uniform and I go up to a young Lieutenant Jane J JG, which is the same as the first Lieutenant everywhere else. And uh, I said, sir, can you tell me where this place is located? And I handed him Bob's W-2 and he looks at it. He says, excuse me for a second. He walks in to the two stars office. He's in there about 15, 20 seconds. He comes out, said, the Admiral will see you now. Now, those of you who have been in the Navy, those of you who have been in the military, you all know that no two-star admiral is going to talk to an enlisted Air Force puke under any circumstances. So I went in there. I gave him a sharp salute. <clears throat> he didn't say <laughs> at ease. He said parade rest. So I'm standing there at parade rest, and he's looking at Lazar's W-2. And he said, Sergeant, I don't know where you've got this, but if I ever see your face cross the threshold of my office, Ever again, you'll be the most sorriest son of a bitch in NCO United States military. Do you understand me, Sergeant? I said, yes, sir. And with that, he puts Lazar's W-2 in the shredder. And he said, you're dismissed. I gave him a sharp salute, did an about face, and walked out. Wow. Now, if, if yeah. Bob was a phony, he I, and the place that paid him was a pretend place, I would have not gotten that reaction. No, hell no. Yeah, and I mean... We yeah, Darcy, jump in on this. And Just, I want to know what you think about the history of the TR-3B, what, what it's being used for and, and everything. Yeah, just to add to what I was saying before, uh, Fred Dunham is the Area 51 security officer that's, you know, still suing the government for cancer, he said he got while working out there. But, um, you know, to, to add to everything that we talked about before, in terms of the TR-3B, I mean, it's it's... It's a fable. Um, we see black triangles. Sometimes we might even see 
some kind of satellite matrix that's moving in a triangular form formation in the night sky. I mean, we're at a time in the present future where technology is getting so advanced. And, you know, you talk about Ray Kurzweil's prediction of the singularity and all that stuff. And it's 2022. We're getting to this point and people are not even realizing we're, we're getting really close to this, right? I That's mean, right. Elon Musk launched the Starlink satellites. And the way that those are designed is that when you look up at the sky in the night sky, it shines back as if it looks like a star. Do you know what the, the, the gravity of that situation is? Is that if I have kids or my kids have kids, when they look at the sky, they're never going to look at the sky the same way that you, Rich, or Jim did growing up. There are now satellites that look like stars. That The right. star field is not ever going to be the same it's not it's not not a natural star field and we don't even know what we're looking at when we see these triangles which again i want to emphasize the outstanding video that you have in here and most of it courtesy of uh, tyler over at secure team uh, and other people as well fantastic video but when we're seeing these objects or capturing them on on, on uh, digitally they're probably not mostly even the TR3B anymore. Who knows what the, what they're creating now, right? I mean, TR3B that's old. So it's got to be a that's got to be a family of craft. Exactly. And yeah, we talked about the the X47B, Jim. That's a, a, a unmanned autonomous flying triangle, right? Pretty much, yeah. And you've got uh, Russia has the exact same thing. If you look up Russia's version of the X-47B, they've got a, a unmanned flying triangle. What's blowing my mind here, like in the old days, like five years ago for me, yeah. I would think, okay, so I want to distinguish our experimental aircraft, that's really amazing, from genuine UFOs. Uh, I used to think, well, there must be some kind of unconventional radical technology that the UFOs are using that we haven't yet gotten to. But I, I don't, I don't think that was correct of me. I mean, uh, I think that there's, you know, I've talked about a breakaway civilization for many, many years. And even so I've still been hesitant to go full on into this idea that we've got our own flying saucer tech that's fully operational. But the more and more we look into it and your film really brings this out very nicely the more I, I start to think we've got, we've got, I don't know if we have Tic Tac UFO tech. Can we make them go eight to 10,000 miles per hour? Uh, like, like the craft that, you know, escaped from um, Dave Fruhoff, you know, way back yeah. when, you know, but, but do we 70s. have it now? Yeah. In the early seventies, do we it, have it now? And I, I'm starting to think maybe it, we do. I mean, what do you, what do you yeah. guys think? In 1982-83 timeframe, I was invited to go to Engineering Week banquet in Minneapolis, St. Paul area, as it was the prom center in St. Paul. The keynote speaker was Kelly Johnson. Now this is eighty. This is it's a 82-83 timeframe. He got up there, he's talking, and, and uh, he said, "We have we have the ability today to fly to Mach four in a manned air breathing aircraft, Mach six, Mach eight, Mach twelve, Mach sixteen. What speed 16? costs speed costs money. How fast do you want to go?" I mean that was that was his that was a direct quote to the you know to the guy to all the 800 engineers uh, at Honeywell. It sounds like what they, I used to hear called uh, transatmospheric vehicles. You know, you'd have to be super high up in the atmosphere to go at any of those types of speeds. I would think, right? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, but I mean, at anything above eighty thousand feet, you're dealing with what four tenths of a percent of the atmosphere. So okay, the, so right, yeah. So the friction friction at that altitude is is, is is not is not really a factor. Uh, solar heating is mm -hmm. the uh, you know the SR seventy one for example at eighty five thousand feet at Mach three point two, the coldest place in that airplane. This is due to uh, solar heating from the sun. It's a black airplane, and uh, the coldest place is the windscreen. It's at 475 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the same temperature as your broiler. My the, God. 
the inlet lip and the leading edge of the rudders are in the neighborhood of a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Incredible. And and the all the dramatic. Now this thing was developed and and built in 32 months using a slide rule. And nobody out there who's unless you're over 50 or over 60, in my case over 70, uh, even knows what a slide rule is. But they de they developed that aircraft uh, to do what it does using yellow pad, a lot of pencils, and a, and a my dad called it his his slip stick, which is his uh, slide rule. Yeah, that's extraordinary. So yeah. you know, just to comment on that, uh, we were just talking about the unmanned vehicles, and if you're talking about vehicles that can go Mach 15, 16, you're now talking about okay, do we have the technology to eliminate the gra gravitic force that's being exerted on the craft and the occupants inside. So that's a question. The other question is, do you even have oc occupants? Yeah, and you, you're assuming that you're assuming that yeah. a lot of these things are manned. In in 1971, 72 timeframe, uh, I was interviewing a, a gentleman named uh, Bill Fox, and Foxy was. He was a flight test manager at the Skunk Works for 37, 36, 37 years. And we were talking about things going fast and, you know, turning and whatever. And he said, yeah, we have, we have a technology right now that you can be going 3,000 miles an hour and make a 90 degree turn, not with an occupant, but the electronics and the, and the control systems. We have that. And that was back in the early 70s. To do that. Wow. Yeah. He said, wow. that's wow. Um, pulling 400, 400 Gs. Yeah, we yeah you know, we we put electronics in cannon rounds and you know like Copperhead and fire them out of a 155 millimeter uh, howitzer. I'd wonder about the structural integrity of a craft like that, or or the uh, you know parts inside. I don't know to make a radical uh, angled turn like that. He said, am, am I wrong for thinking that? But it just seems like it'd be incredible. I mean, even if there's no person inside. You no, know, they have the, they have the ability. But, you know, Bill said, yeah, that's not that's not a that's not a wow. a uh, fascinating a problem yeah but yeah. look you you've got people out there that have made accusations in this research field uh talking about the tic tac ufo being a man-made object and i don't yeah. believe it to be i've discussed this with you before a little bit we've you know i said before braver mentioned tic tac when we looked at an object like this on video or in photographs from way back in the day, mm -hmm. we talked about a cigar shaped UFO. Absolutely. A and that, that shape's been described and that speed has been described since the 1940s at the least. Yes. So, the speeds. you know, when I hear about people like Michael Sala making up that Lockheed Skunk Works has had this technology and has built the Tic Tac UFO, I think it's garbage. I think, you know, he also made up the r rumor that Eisenhower met with aliens at a uh, air force base. There's just, well, it's unfounded. That goes, that goes way before anything Michael Sala was saying. That's, that's an old, old. Um, I, have, I have a, I have a comment along those lines on June 3rd of last year, I did a book mm -hmm. signing at the skunk works on my 75 years of Lockheed skunk works. And I spent two and a half hours with the vice president general manager, Jeff Babion. And we were heading over to the U-2 operation on the other side of Air Force Plant 42 there at Palmdale. And we're in the back of this uh, uh, limousine heading over there. And I looked at him, we're two feet apart. And I, I looked him right in the eye. I said, all right, Jeff, what's the Skunk Works involvement in alien technology? You know, UFOs. Mm -hmm. And he said, I have not. I mean, he, he was one, I think he was surprised I asked him. And two, he, you know, he said, he said, I have, I have not been briefed on anything along those lines. And, and, and I, I honestly believe him in that. He said, but that doesn't mean that they didn't, that project came here, was developed, it's now gone, and I have no need to know what happened in the past. So maybe when Ben was around, maybe when uh, Sherm Mullen was around or Jack Gordon was around, that- uh, There's Lockheed like rumors that. with UFOs that abound. I mean, even a year ago, you had the late uh, Senator Harry Reid making the connection to the New Yorker magazine 
almost almost openly before he had to yeah. walk it back in a series of, in a tweet. Yeah, but, but he's uh, not the first. Yeah, Je Jeff says, I said, personally, we can't be alone. The universe is too big. He said, but Lockheed's official policy, I mean, I said, he said, I have absolutely no knowledge. If I did, it, I would have to say no comment, but I'm not saying that because he hasn't been briefed on it. So he has no knowledge of UFO involvement with technology used by the Lucky Skunk Works. I, I think they've got an intact craft in there somewhere. That's my opinion about Lockheed. Yeah. But. <laughs> to me, <laughs> me too. To me, like <laughs> it's logical that many things that are up there are possibly ours. Mm -hmm. But historically, we're looking at our involvement in trying to reproduce this. If if you go by the rumor of something like the TR three B flying in 1979 and maybe only being operational in the late 80s and then you get the belgian ufo wave and stuff like that in the 90s maybe mm -hmm. some of that's ours right but there's things that have been reported from like the 1800s that describe you know cigar shaped ufos is that a i was in the i was in the canadian national archives many years ago it's a case i've talked about a bit um back in the 1970s and 80s if you're a canadian citizen you could report your UFO encounter to uh, what was called the National Research Council in Ottawa. They never did anything with the reports. They would just take them and put them in a little filing cabinet and, and run away from them. But uh, you can go to Ottawa now and, and go through them, which I did years ago. And there was a report sent in from the, in the early 80s from an elderly man who said, I was 25 years old in 1936. And this guy had a cool job. He said, I was doing aerial uh, surveys for the Canadian government in the Northwest Territories, basically doing photography, like topographical photographs, like probably for the first time, Canada had the ability to fly over these areas and photograph them. And so he had a, like a I guess, a pontoon plane that could land on the water. And he's out in the, you know, where there's an infinite number of lakes way, way, way up there. And he was at a place he called, uh, described as Aylmer Lake, A-Y-L-M-E-R. And I, I found it on the map. It's breathtakingly far north. There's no, no one can live there. Like you can't, there's, I mean, I'm sure there's amazing fishing. There's some hardy souls that can maybe fly up there, but there's nothing there. Never has been. So this guy is up there and he said it was a perfect uh, sky, 1936. I looked up and above me, he said, was the most perfect configuration of an airship one could imagine. And he described it exactly the way Fravor would describe the Tic Tac UFO, except not solar white, but more of like a, a dull gunmetal gun gray. But no reflection, no, um, no markings on it whatsoever, no windows, nothing. It was just this slightly elongated object. It, he said it was in a north-south uh, orientation. He said, and I watched it. I couldn't tell how high up it was because there was no reference point. This guy was a very, very smart guy. You could tell just in the writing. He said, but it seemed like it was a pretty good size. And I watched it rotate silently from a north-south to an east-west orientation and instantly, without a sound, accelerate like a bullet. He said it was at the horizon in moments. And uh, it kind of shocked him. And all these years later, almost 50 years later, he's writing to the National Research Canada of Can the Council of Canada just to record it. He said, look, you can't investigate this. I just wanted you to have it. Here's my military records, which he apparently included. I was not able to see them. They were not included in the archives, but uh, this guy was the real deal. He saw this thing. It was right over. And the other thing that made me wonder is like, he's in the middle of nowhere. And this thing was right over him, clearly checking him out and then taking off. So that's 1936. That's, that's not Nazi German technology. That's, that's nothing. That's nothing that we could have had. And that's a Tic Tac UFO with instant acceleration in 1936. And some of these cases go back even farther. Well, you go, there's petroglyphs with uh, alien. I mean, it looked like little gray man with things up in the sky with beams coming down that, you know, they know are 10,000 years old or, mm -hmm. or older. Yeah, absolutely. Some very suggestive, you know, they weren't doing history back then. They, there was no MUFON out there investigating <laughs> sightings. But there were stories, there was oral tradition. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, they're all very compelling. Well, look, I think I was going to end this at 55 minutes, and here we are. It's an hour and 10 minutes, but uh, I think this is awesome. Hey, so Darcy, I want people to know your website, and uh, it's occultjourneys.com. Yeah, that's right. That's just my 
uh, at your film, film studio website if people want to check out uh, the trailer to my films, a little description. If they click on the poster, it'll take them right through to a link to watch one of my films. So uh, mm -hmm. I've covered a lot of different areas and uh, really appreciate working with you, man. You know, you keep it grounded. You're, you're a good man. And uh, thanks for having me on to talk about this newest creation. And um, if people like what they see, please, as an independent filmmaker, leave a review on the Amazon prime page. Uh, I'm just going to ask so it's available IMDb. on prime. Yeah. It's and available any, on any other platforms. Uh, Voodoo iTunes, Google play a uh, whole bunch of platforms. So definitely please leave a review on IMDb or, or even Amazon prime and, and a star rating. It, it means a lot. Uh, I love the feedback. Look, I was really happy to participate in this. The real stars of this, honestly, were Jim, uh, uh, Jeremy, Tyler. They were all amazing. I was just happy to be there. And um, I think the whole thing came out very, very well. Uh, the uh, woman who was in there, her, that witness, Astara? Alara. Alara. Yeah, she goes. She was she outstanding. A, yeah, she, she was outstanding. A, goes by Alara N5D on YouTube. Well, she was a good witness, really, really good. And uh, you had Jack Casher on um, and a lot of just great information. So I thought uh, it was really well done. And Jim, if anyone yeah. wants to find you, I think you said Facebook. Is that the place? Yeah, I'm on Facebook, Jim Goodall. <laughs> and, you know, if you want any of my books, I have uh, 29. Well, yeah, 29 will be in print by the end of this year. My tw I just sent my 29th book off. But if you want my 75 years of the Lockheed Skunk Works, or my Blackbird or B2 books, or even my submarine books. Uh, message me on, on Facebook if you want a signed autograph copy. I'll sell it to you retail price plus shipping. Um, but if you want to get, get it and maybe track me down someday, go to Amazon, books by James C. Goodall, and just start looking for stuff. Some of my stuff is hidden now, and I don't, I'm not sure why, but... I may be politically incorrect. Uh, uh oh, for sure. <laughs> but again, it's it's my seventy-five year book. It's uh, three hundred eighty-four pages, over seven hundred photos, cover forty some odd programs. Uh, half the photos have never been published before, and I even had, I think it was Jack Gordon or Sherman Mullen, one of two, one of the former presidents of the Skunk Works, said, "You had some programs I didn't even know about in that book." So that tickled me. Nice. Very nice. And I'm very proud. And it's in its third printing, which is uh, for a 400, almost 400 page book. That's, that's really good. And it's only been out six months. Amazing. 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 And, Guys, I, must, I, oh, and yeah. I gotta, I gotta say that, you know, I just entered the, the, this community in 19 uh, correction, uh, 2019. And the first person I ever interviewed with for three hours was Richard Dolan. We had we had a fantastic interview. Um, that was I titled funny. it. I think I titled it "Badass Interview with Jim Goodall." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that was amazing. appropriate. You were you were you were amazing. Well, guys, it was wonderful having both of you, Darcy Darcy Ware, a filmmaker, and Jim Goodall. Uh, what a pleasure! I think everyone loved hearing both of you. And uh, really, I think it was very good that we got to talk about not just a TR three B, but just that. The, the nature, just scratching the surface of, of what is clearly in a very advanced secret space program that is in operation here on this planet and is something that we never get to hear about um, in our official, you know, uh, mainstream establishment media. It just doesn't, doesn't tell us anything that's worth knowing anyway. So, Darcy, great work on this film. And I'll have links below. People can check it out. And, uh, and Darcy and Jim, thank you both very much for being My pleasure. Here. Look forward to another one. Someday. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Mine as well. So that's all we got. Uh, thanks everyone for being here with us in, uh, and we'll be back again, everyone. In the meantime, let's keep fighting the good fight. Chin up. We'll get through all of these difficult times later, everyone. Yep. Take care. Bye-bye.